Good morning, Heart Revolution Church. Isn't he faithful? Can you stand to your feet and give God a clap of praise? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. To our online audience campus, which my wife is joining today, I love you. Thank you for watching the service twice. And uh, my grandmother, she's in the, the hospital. She's kind of a pillar of faith to our family. So to my grandmother, I keep texting them to make sure she watches the service. So can you give it up for my grandma? She, uh, she would sing a lot of songs to me, and she'd say, uh, th there's a song she'd say, uh, Lord, Lord, I can't even walk. Without you holding my hand, the mountains too high and the valleys too wide. Down on my knees, I learned to stand. Lord, I can't even walk without you holding my hand. Right? What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and pains he'll bear. What a privilege to carry air. Thing to God. For all you young people, you, you, you got to realize how the other generation made it. It wasn't video games. <laughs> they had to sing their way through, pray their way through, believe their way through. Who can? Stand against us when we call that great name. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, we have the victory. Bishop, can you come get on the keys real quick? Oh, <laughs> Woo, come on. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus. Jesus, we have the victory. Hey, come on. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. We have the victory. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus. Give it up for Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Oh, we have the victory. Well, now bless that wonderful name of Jesus. Well, now bless that wonderful name of Jesus. Oh, now bless that wonderful name of Jesus, oh, we have the victory. Well, what a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Well, angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. Come on, give it up for Jesus. Come on, can you celebrate with my grandma for a second? She might be going to heaven, but. Oh, oh I'll fly away, oh glory. I'll fly away. Fly away, 
<laughs> Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 13, verse number 9. Some of you are like, what happened? <laughs> All right, I, you guys will be in church for four hours. Don't you do it, Bishop. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 13, verse number 9. Hebrews chapter 13, verse number 9. Do not be carried away about with various and strange doctrines. For it is good that the heart be established by grace, not with foods which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside of the camp. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is, the fruit of our lips. Give thanks to his name. But do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Today I want to talk to you uh, about the, from the subject, a new altar, a new altar. God, in the name of Jesus, we pray that your Holy Spirit go before us. Minister to your sons and your daughters like only you can. We give you all the praise, thanks, and glory. In Jesus' name, you can be seated today. Religion often is thought of as something that happens at church. But religion is born out of man's response to his own sin. So you can be religious and not even go to church. Your relationship is the first husband Baptist down the street, father of three. And your traditions and performance to your family can become a religion. Religion simply clothes itself in performance. The Bible says this in Hebrews 10, day after day every priest stands and performs his religious duties again and again. He offers the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. There is a performance that has been built inside of us. Since we were little kids and you went to the doctor and at the doctor they said, if you are good, you get a lollipop. And they didn't tell you to go to the dentist later with rotten teeth, but what are you going to do when I'm good then? If you are good, if you get good grades, then I'll give you $5. That is not an issue. A good reward is not an issue. The issue is, is when we saw authority, we thought we had to perform well to get good. And the issue then becomes we live a life to try to justify our life and existence. Some of us, some of us, we have tried to justify our lives by being in the gym because they called you chubby when you were 11 years old. And now you are at the gym justifying your life, taking a selfie in the bathroom at the gym to show that 11-year-old bully who you are now. Some of you got a college degree, not because you like school, but because somebody called you stupid. And so your whole life has been performing, achieving, so you can show them that you weren't stupid. Some of you take pictures with your new boo, filter it up, 
to try to show the old boo how happy you are now. And you say the most romantic things. You don't even know the vocabulary into which you speak. You are making up words that do not exist. But you are justifying yourself by performing. We are so happy together. We never fight my best friend in the entire world. If it was so true, why do you have to keep repeating it to yourself? Just because you look good doesn't mean it is good. Just because you put it out there and paint an image of performance. It's the religion of social media. It's the religion of imagery. It's the religion of relationship. Hebrews 13.9 said this, Do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines, for it is good that the heart be established by grace, not with foods. The issue is not relationships and the fact that you have a job, that's a great thing. The fact that you are a father and a mother, that's actually a great thing. But when we make the great things the ultimate things, then the good things become idols. Let me say it this way. Grace is not a subject in this church. Grace is a foundation of this church. And grace has established every good work. Which means if you build your house on family and vacations and, and build your house on pleasure and all of these other good things, when the storm comes... When the storm comes, the things you build your life on cannot withstand it. The Bible said in Matthew, it said, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew great against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell with a great crash. Notice there's two houses, one built on the sand and one built on the rock. No matter where you build your house, the storm will come. Just because you build your house on a rock doesn't mean that the storm won't come. Just because you build your house on the sand doesn't mean the storm won't come. Wherever you build your house, the storm of life will come. But if you'll begin and continue to stand, will be what you built your house, based off what you built your house on. And for those of us who have built our house on things other than, than the grace of God. It will not stand. It will not last. But I'm glad that God has come to establish grace in our hearts as a foundation to our faith that when the storms come, I can say thank you, Jesus. Praise his name. He is worthy. Not because of the storm or in reaction to the storm, but in response to his keeping, sustaining, and sufficient grace in my life. I'm praising God not because everything is well put together. I'm praising God because I have a firm foundation that I can stand on. A cornerstone, a chief cornerstone. Jesus Christ has our hearts been established by the grace of God when we come to this new altar. This new covenant altar, we receive a foundation of God's amazing grace. When we come to this altar, we receive access to his grace. Hebrews 13.10 said this, We have an altar from which those who minister at the tabernacle have no right to eat. I want to read a few scriptures. I don't want you to confuse this with a TED talk. This is not that. We're going to read the Bible in church. It's what... We do. We read the Bible in church. Second Peter 1 Peter 1.3 said this, His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by the glory and virtue. 
His divine power has given to us all things, not some things, all things that pertain to life and godliness. Everything we need now and for the future, we already possess in Christ. So the enemy would want you to chase things down that God's already given you access to. Are you a teenager? That's close enough. Come stand right here. What is this? It's $20. Do we need to make it? Is it made? It's awesome. Do you like $20? Do you need $20? You don't need it, huh? Because you don't pay the rent, right? <laughs> so you don't know what you need because you don't know who's paying for it. If you don't need it, how, how come you don't want to take it? You can take it. You want it? Can you give it to your mom? Can you give it to your mom for me? Okay, thank you. I'm going to tell you something. If I, if I pull out $20 in front of my kids, they will snatch that right up out of my hands. You know she's got good parents because she doesn't even know she needs $20. One of the reasons she doesn't take that 20 from me is because we don't have relationship like that. But if you, if it was my kid, either, all four of them, even the one-year-old, <laughs> they would not blink. They would snatch it up out of my hand because they know that I'm their father, I'm blessed, and they have access to what I've made. This is what happens. I say, hey, the grace of God, it's established in our heart. It's available to you. Hey, you want the grace of God? No. Uh, maybe. Do you want me to have the grace of God? And so as believers, we don't know what we actually have access to. You have a mansion that you don't have the code to the, to the gate, so you don't even get to the house because you don't know what you have access to. So you're praying and believing and striving, God, give me a miracle. And he's like, healing's already been provided. You just got to take it. Joy is not something you have to chase up the mountain and down the street. Joy is already available. You just have to take it. Peace is already available to you. You just have to take it. I wish somebody would realize you actually have access to everything, all things that pertain to life and godliness. It's available by faith through grace in Christ Jesus. Woo. You have access to everything that God died for. He provided for you access. The issue is, the scripture says, that whoever wants to be great must become a servant of all. And so we're like, woo, okay. Greatness is the goal. I want to be great. So when we say greatness is the goal, servant becomes the identity. And as a servant, we start trying to work our way up the ladder to greatness. Who's the greatest in the kingdom? So that position might now make me great. Because greatness is the goal. Riches are the goal. Success is the goal. But when you have these goals, when greatness is the goal, servant is the identity. But when Jesus is the goal, son is the identity. And when son is the identity, greatness is the lifestyle. And so everything you put your hands to, every relationship, you are living in greatness because you are a son and daughter and have access to your father's inheritance. My kids still don't knock on the door. They just come in. They don't pay for the groceries, but they partake of the groceries because they are sons of the house. And when you know that Jesus Christ has brought you in as sons and daughters, you have access. You are not a beggar. You are not a servant. You are a son and a daughter. 
Some of you are at the old covenant altar where you keep taking and serving the sacrifice. And Jesus said, you're not serving the sacrifice anymore. The altar has become the table where you sit down and you feast in communion and fellowship with me. So you begin to sit at the table and say, God is good. I have access to everything, all things that pertain to life and godliness. I want to be more holy. Maybe I should perform my way to holiness. Maybe if I dress up right, then I'll be holy. Maybe if I quit cussing, then I'll be holy. Maybe if I do these things, then I'll be holy. You have access to the nature of God. And in his nature, when you're at the table, what you eat, you are. And so you are partaking of his divine nature, and holiness is your diet. And you begin to put on the garments of righteousness, and you take on an identity that's not yours, and you are not becoming holy. You are a holy people. How do I get holy? I accept Jesus and his holiness. How do I get righteous? I accept his righteousness and receive it. If we realize at this new altar, it is an altar where we receive a foundation of God's grace. It is an altar where we have access to his grace. And number three, at this new altar, we have boldness from his grace. Scripture says in Hebrews 13, the high priest carries the blood of animals into the most holy place as a sin offering. But the bodies are burned outside the camp. And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. What happened is when they would come, they would put the sacrifice upon the altar and they would have a burnt offering, which means they would burn the total of the sacrifice. And after they burnt the total of the sacrifice, they would take the ashes that were seemingly shameful and they would take them on the outside of the city gate. Anytime the Bible mentions outside the city, of, city gate, it's talking about a shameful thing. The dung outside of the city gate, the leper outside of the city gate, it's talking about shame. Jesus died as the ashes outside of the city gate. He took on our shame to, so that we might receive his righteousness. He took on our guilt so that we might receive his freedom outside of the city gate. Woo! When Jesus, when the priest would offer the sacrifice, he would come out and shout to the, to the people and he'd say, it is finished. The issue is they had to keep doing sacrifices so it never was finished. Jesus, when we read the Old Testament, it is a type and shadow pointing us to a greater principle, to a greater altar, to a greater sacrifice. So in the New Covenant, in the New Testament, we see the final altar of the cross being erected. And we see the Lamb of God being put upon the altar. And we hear the Lamb, the sacrifice, and the priest crying out, to Telestai, it is finished. When the Jewish people heard this term, to Telestai, it had several different meanings. It was a military term that announced total victory. It was a judicial term that released the guilt. It was a financial term that forgives debt. It was a sacrificial term that meant the sacrifice is completely done. When Jesus died on the cross and said, it is finished, he was saying, I'm announcing today your victory. I'm releasing you of your guilt. Your debt is forgiven, and the sacrifice is completely finished. It is finished. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. When you 
receive the revelation of what Christ has accomplished. You don't have to walk in fear or be timid or be scared, but you can walk from a place of godly confidence because you've been at the throne of grace. You've received from a new altar where faith and favor have collaborated and come together to present to you daily his goodness. A lot of times we use faith and we try to perform faith. Well, I'm believing for this. I'm believing for that. And our faith turns into striving and working rather than faith diving deep into the nature of God. A deep faith and sense of trust in God that we walk in. Where faith and favor come together and they say it is the grace of God and the faith of God that is going to present to you better things. You're like, God's against me. I lost my job. You got a better job coming. Pays less, but they're nice. God, I'll stay broke with some nice people. I don't want to be rich with mean people. I went to Starbucks this last week with Oscar, one of our uh, leaders. And there was a young lady who was working there, and she had noticed Oscar because we have a life group over there. And she started talking about ministry, and the Holy Spirit hit me and said, her father died of cancer. And so I do what every good prophecy does. How's your dad? You know, when you, you're unsure, you're like, you start, it's called prophecy fishing. How are you? <laughs> She's like, oh, my, my father passed away like, of, of cancer? Yes. And it had been two years since she'd been involved in ministry because of the pain of losing her father. And I said, you know what, maybe this is the moment that God is using to remind you of who you are. You mean her deceased father from two years ago, the faith that he planted, met her two years later in the future to remind her of who she is. I went outside and as she was checking out our clocking out. She said, can I show you guys the, the video of my father preaching his last sermon? I said, yeah, I'd love to see it. And I turned on the video and it was like, I know your dad. Your dad worked for me. Your dad used to always tell me about his girls and his ministry. Woo. When faith and favor present to you good gifts. I've been praying. I want Maverick City to come to Heart Revolution Church. I've been praying so bad. They don't call me back, though. I send emails. I do all that. They don't call me back. And then one week later, I'm sitting in the office, and Chandler Moore says, Hey, Pastor, this is Chandler Moore. Jara, you are not. I wasn't. I'm like, oh, he must have heard about my preaching. Cool. Chandler's calling me. <laughs> What's up, Chan? <laughs> He's like, somebody told me you knew somebody that had a golden doodle. In case y'all don't know, a golden doodle is like a golden retriever with a poodle. I said, Lord, is Chandler Moore calling me for a golden doodle? When I was, I'm believing for Maverick City. I want to, where, come on, fill out the form. Where, where, where he coming, Maverick? Chandler, you got a golden doodle? <laughs> when favor and faith come together and present to you good gifts. Woo, unexpected grace. Unexpected. What if? The faith and favor in the nature of God. You said, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm happy to know Jesus. And if Jesus opens this door or closes that door, you present to me good gifts. Even an earthly father, if his son asks for bread, would he get a stone? Would he give him a serpent? How much more your heavenly father? When you ask of him, does he not want to provide for you good things? Woo! 
What if walking in faith and grace and depending on the goodness of God to present to you as gifts, things that you couldn't earn or achieve? God said, hey, I just want to say I love you. I just want to remind you I I love you. I know you thought a lot of things this week, and I know you're believing for a new car, and you're believing for a bigger house, and you're believing for the promotion, and you're going up the mountain, and we're believing for, but what you're believing for will fade away. The thing you call a blessing, that car, blessings don't rust or get repo. <laughs> The blessings, the transportation, God, and if somebody picks me up, if I get a bus pass in the name of Jesus, however you want to provide for me, whatever you want to do in my life, I receive the goodness of God for my life. This is a, this is a new altar. The relationships you've been fighting with, it's because you don't see them as God's goodness being presented to you. So you don't receive it as a gift. You think you earned it, so you think you own it. So you try to control. You don't own nobody. You can't fix anybody. You can't even fix yourself. You can't even fix your cricket teeth. So you need the mercy. We need the mercy of God. Everything we have in life is a gift. Everything we have in life, the, the, the air we're breathing is a gift. The fact that we're here today is a gift of God's grace. And when we come to that altar, he says, give me a sacrifice of praise that is pleasing unto me and say, thank you, Jesus. Come on, can anyone give a sacrifice of praise? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Woo! I'm not asking for anything. I just want to thank you for everything. God, I didn't come here to get handouts today. I just want to thank you for being God of my life. I want to thank you for faith. I want to thank you for what you're doing. I want to thank you for your work. I want to thank you for your mercy. I just want to thank you. Come on, can you thank him? We thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Man, Lord, we, discontentment comes from offense, and it never lets you thank God in the moment. It always searches for what's next, and it always lives in the past of regret. Paul said, I've learned to be content. Whether people honor me or dishonor me, Sometimes they're good to me, sometimes they're bad. Poor, yet making other people rich. Abounding, yet abased. I've learned to be content. What if God in this moment says, I want you to learn to live in this moment. Quit letting the enemy put carrots in front of you. Oh, it, when you get married, you'll be happy. When you get divorced, you'll be happy. When you have kids, you'll be happy. When they go to college, you'll be happy. When they come back to see you, you'll be happy. When you get a dog, they'll be happy. When you get rid of the dog, you'll be happy. It's always something in front of me that's going to make me happy. So let me go look at, the, the old term was keeping up with the Joneses. Let me look at their life. With pastors, it's keeping up with the churches. Oh, did you see their Instagram? Man, they're giving out food this week. What are we going to do? Discontentment comes from offense. It comes from sin. It's our reaction to try to justify our life. There is an altar that says you are justified by faith alone, by grace alone, in the finished work of Christ alone. And we're just happy. We're just excited to be a part of what God is doing right now in this moment. Why plan a year from now? <laughs> the scripture said, you don't even know if you'll be alive in a year. And that's not fear. That's just
just say, why don't I just trust God in this moment? Why don't I just enjoy the relationships God has entrusted me with in this moment? Why don't I just praise God and thank God in this moment? I will, if I wasn't going through all this, then I would, if I wasn't thinking all this, if I wasn't facing all this, then I would. No, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't. But if you can praise him and thank him and trust and believe in him and say, God, I'm just, this moment, I don't know if I get another one of these moments with, with these people. Like, I don't know if they'll come back to church. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe not. But all these unique people, like you're giving me the opportunity to stand before your children. People who are struggling, people who are millionaires that could pay off the church and they're deciding if they're going to do that right now. <laughs> struggling relationships and kids and addictions and all this representation of flawed humanity and we're all together saying, look how good God is. Look how amazing God's grace is. Come on. You got the lawyer and the criminal up in here. You got the rich and the poor. You got the crazy and semi-crazy. All in one place saying, hey, every different walk of life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Would you stretch both of your hands as a sacrifice of praise? We want to sing this out over you. Oh. Your name is light. We thank you, Jesus. such a boldness, such a boldness. When you're in the presence of God, boldness comes up on you. And we are called to be ambassadors of the kingdom of God. I was driving through the city the other day and just these thoughts were coming to me like there is no witch or warlock or, or psychic in this city that has dominion over this region. This is our city. We have the mantle of this city. We are going after families. We are going to do what God has called us to do. If you need deliverance, if you need healed, in Jesus' name, you came to the right house. We own this city in the spirit. So we better act like it. We take authority by the name of Jesus, by the calling and the mantle that you have put on this house, God. Thank you, God, for using us as bold ambassadors to reach our neighbors and love our neighbors, to love our family and reach our family. Thank you for making us messengers, preachers of the gospel. Thank you, God. There is now no condemnation. There's no spirit of fear that God has given you. There is no spirit of fear. Unworthiness bows down at the name of Jesus. Oh, I don't know if I'm qualified. You're not qualified, but by his grace you are. Get to work. Let God use you. With every eye closed, if it's the first time or the first time in a long time and you've never received Jesus, I want to say a quick prayer with you. Would you just wave your hand at me real quick? Let me know who I'm praying with. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you, mama. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless the side. Everybody, I want you to repeat after me. Jesus. Forgive us of our sins. Come in our heart and mind. Create in us a clean heart. And renew us in us a right spirit. From this day forward, we will serve you. We love you because you first loved us. We accept you because you first accepted us. 
in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. And in that moment, would you lift your hands, receive you the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. Your name. Come on, receive the Holy Spirit. We thank you, God. Come on, lift your head. 